Morning, everyone. So firstly, today, we're going to take you through the half year 2023 financials. But we know investors are particularly interested in current trading, especially with the current economic backdrop. So the second half of the presentation is dedicated to this and includes current trading, product expansion, customer acquisition and retention, operations, sales channels, and finally, the outlook for the future. So before Steve goes through the details, the key highlights of the first six months of the financial year. So we had revenue of 21 million, which is up 72% year on year. We've had our second six months of profitability. And this strong growth has been equally achieved on our own site and through our third party partners. We're successfully continuing to navigate the external challenges. And we further expanded and diversified our product range and had really strong performance across all our KPIs. So in terms of our financial highlights, starting with revenue, where our revenue for the first half of the financial year was 21 million, a 72% increase on the 12.2 million achieved in the first half of the previous year. This increase includes record trading across all sales channels, enabling us to take market share across all categories. Further investment in stock has enabled us to deliver this growth, which has been delivered equally across both our own sites and through our third party partners. The total growth in revenue was 8.8 million with growth from our own site being 4.3 million and growth from third parties being 4.5 million. In terms of profit before tax, we've delivered the second six month period of PBT. Our PBT was 0.1 million, which is a substantial positive swing versus last year where we made a loss of 1.1 million. This swing is driven by our revenue growth, ongoing operational efficiencies, and further improvement across our customer engagement KPIs, which we will come on to talk about later on. On the right is our gross margin, which was 54.4%, reduced compared to the 56.5% in the previous year. This reduction is all due to a planned end of season sale in late July and August, which we did not do in the previous year. Excluding the impact of the sale, underlying margins have been in line with the prior year, with some inflationary pressures on raw materials being offset by economies of scale and reduced average freight rates. This is a result of using sea freight for a much larger proportion of inbound stock, which is much cheaper and also significantly less impactful on the environment. In terms of our overheads, we have seen a further substantial reduction in our overheads as a percent of net revenue, reducing to 53% compared with 65% in the previous year. The benefit of scale, coupled with making sure we spend effectively across all areas of the business, has enabled us to bring down this percentage. The chart on the right is a breakdown of our actual overhead spend which was 11 million for the period, which is a 42% increase on the same period last year. The single largest increase was in commissions retained by our third party partners, which increased to 2.4 million compared with 1.1 million in the previous year. This is a direct cost of the substantial growth in revenue that we have achieved in the period with Next, M&S and John Lewis. Our fulfillment costs, which includes the cost of warehousing and customer postage increased by 48% to 2.9 million. However, this reduced from 16% to 14% as a percentage of revenue year on year. This reduction reflects a higher proportion of bulk transfers to our third parties and ongoing productivity initiatives being delivered in our operation. Operation costs increased by a million in the period, but again, this reduced as a percentage of revenue from 18% to 15%. Operation costs include the cost of people, systems, and general admin expenditure, which is supporting the growth of our company. There remains further opportunity to reduce our overheads as a percent of revenue in H2 and into the next financial year. I've now got a few slides showing some of our key KPIs They are all for our own site, sasanda.com only. On the left, 
visits to our website increased in the first six months by 25% to 7.7 million. This included three of the six months in the period being new records, reflecting the increased awareness of our brand and the response to our customer communication strategy. We are delighted with the significant increase in conversion, which is on the right hand chart, which continues to go from strength to strength. The average for the first half was 4.5% up from 3.9% in the same period the prior year. In addition to our marketing and how we engage with our customers, this step up is a reflection of the amount of product choice that we have available for our customers. The increase in conversion resulted in 347,000 orders being generated on sasanda.com in the first half of the current financial year, which is 43% more than in the same period of the previous year. Again, we have three record months in the period with five of the six months having more than 50,000 orders, which is special given that we only had our first 50,000 order month last October. Our average order value stepped up to £90 in the period, which is four percentage points above the prior year, reflecting the product offering being expanded, which has enabled us to increase the average units per order. And you can see here the success of our customer acquisition strategy with new orders up significantly year on year, whilst also achieving a material reduction in the cost of acquisition. This is down to our powerful marketing strategy, which I'm going to go into more detail later on in the presentation. We know our customers inside out. They have diverse wardrobe needs. They're affluent and they shop with us regularly. The success of our product and communication is proven in the rapid rise we see here in repeat customer orders, which are up 53% year on year, with over 70% of our orders now coming from repeat customers. The number of active customers i.e. people who've shopped with us at least once in the last 12 months has quadrupled in three years, now standing at over a quarter of a million people. An ever-increasing proportion of those customers are becoming regular shoppers. And the frequency of buying amongst these regular customers has rocketed. On average, a repeat customer now shops with us over four times a year. Here is our full income statement for the first half of FY23. In summary, our revenue is up 72% to 21 million and 388% up on two years ago. We have delivered the second six month period of profitability with PBT of 0.1 million, which is a substantial positive swing against the 1.1 million loss in the previous year. Moving on to our balance sheet, our net assets increased 15% to 10.9 million as at September 2022. Our net cash at the same date is 4.2 million, which is after the planned step up in inventory to meet customers' demand across all sales channels. In particular, we took the conscious decision to bring stock in earlier for the current autumn winter season, particularly for our third party partners in order to maximize sales across the whole of the selling season. In addition, in line with what we have said previously, we have taken advantage of using sea freight to bring a much greater proportion of stock into the UK, which has the effect of suppressing cash as payment is made earlier. However, this switch to sea freight and away from air freight in particular enables us to reduce our environmental impact and also delivers gross margin benefit as the cost of sea freight is much lower than using air freight in particular for heavier, bulkier product categories that we've got in the winter season. Our inventory balance is therefore greater as we have more stock in transit as we buy the majority of stock on FOB terms, meaning we take title of the stock in the country of origin. Our payables balance has increased in the period to 9.9 .9 million, which recognises the larger amount of stock being purchased, bringing more of the season stock in earlier and using C freight for a greater proportion. Our average payment terms have continued to improve over the last 12 months as we purchase greater volumes and we further cement our relationships with suppliers. And finally, our receivables balance has increased, reflecting the significant step up in revenue 
that we are now doing with our third party partners. We're now going to move on to current and future trading. And in this section, we're going to cover product, marketing, operations, sales channels and outlook. We are delighted to say we've had a really strong start to the second half, and that's despite a challenging economic backdrop. In fact, we've had records galore with consecutive record months in October and November. And this is both on our own site and across our third party partners. In addition, both months have continued to be profitable and margin has actually been higher than in the first half of the year. And we've seen high demand across all our product categories with particular emphasis on coats, party wear and smart tailoring. We've also had a really successful launch with M Brown We've been their most successful new brand launch this year and sales are rocketing with all our partners. We're often asked what the key drivers are to our success, especially in such challenging economic times. The key driver is our distinctive and expansive product range. And this product is made even more desirable by the fact that we photograph and video every single outfit in a lifestyle environment that emotionally engages with our customer. We also have a huge addressable market that we can continue to take share from, building an ever-growing affluent customer base. Underpinning all this is our team and company culture, which is entrepreneurial and agile, whilst also being well-planned and disciplined. And as a team, we have absolute clarity in our vision and our ambition. We want to dress women across the globe to feel sexy and chic, and we believe our opportunity is to be one of the biggest women's wear brands in the world. And to remind you, our addressable market in the UK alone of women over 35 is a massive 20 million. As age doesn't determine how women dress, whatever age we recruit a customer at, Sir Sander's opportunity is to dress customers for their entire lives. So now to talk about the heart of our business, the product. We are continually told by customers and third party partners that Sir Sanders product range has created something truly new and differential in the market. From a practical level, we create head to toe outfits that flatter figures, whether our customer is a size six or a size 20. We give her a mid level price point. We give her outfits she can always wear a bra with, outfits that are good quality and so long lasting. And we offer a wide product range that covers all occasions. We have unique prints that are designed in-house and unique shapes, as well as the vibrant colours she craves. And on an emotional level, the clothes make women feel sexy and chic. They boost her confidence and they make her feel youthful and desirable. So you can see on this chart that all our categories are in growth. The reason all categories are in growth is we have expanded and continue to expand the number of styles in all categories. And we constantly innovate across all categories. We make sure we are constantly at the forefront of customer behaviour, anticipating what she'll buy into and making sure we give her the choice she craves. And we also maximise bestsellers whilst constantly bringing newness in to limit risk and to keep her engaged. It is our strategy to continue expanding the number of styles in all categories, whilst also maintaining our strategy of on-trend, quality, long-lasting, lifestyle-appropriate clothes. As you can see from the pie chart, we already have a really equitable mix across all product categories and we are in all main women's wear categories. However, there is still lots of room for expansion in all the categories. We are fast tracking those categories where we know she is most likely to spend. We have a whole new summer occasion wear package launching for the first time. Holiday and swim is going to be big with all our third parties desperate for the offering. And we are also backing smart dressing as she's really buying into this. What also sets the Sandra apart is our intrinsic understanding of our customer and our powerful communication with her. We brought our extensive experience in media to Sandra, enabling us to develop a highly effective marketing strategy that is seen as excel in every area of media, whether it be TV, social media, glossy brochures, email, digital or PR. We run TV like a digital campaign with a brand new low cost creative every month, leading to unheard of response rates from our television advertising. We're one of the few brands to make print media a cost effective primary acquisition tool. We see fantastic return on investment on digital and social channels and umpteen celebrities wear our clothes without us paying them a single penny. 
This success across all forms of media has created an acquisition machine that means our cost of acquisition has reduced materially year on year, as you saw at the beginning of the presentation. Our success in email communication means we have a constant direct line to our customers where we can communicate with her for free. One of the key results of this is that a whopping 50% of our revenue is now self-generated through email. Moving on to our sales strategy, our own site growth is always the anchor to our success. We work online with the biggest women's wear retailers in the UK, all of which approached us and all of which we can continue to grow rapidly with. So far, we work with Next, m and John Lewis, Berry and M. Brown. On all our third-party sites, Sandra has been identified as a key growth partner. On Next and m and where we have strategically invested the most stock, we are already a top five brand. Our strategy going forward is to scale our own site and all existing channels and then start to expand overseas through third-party sites. In terms of delivering future growth, we have significant operational bandwidth to enable this to happen. From a supplier perspective, we've always had a diverse network of suppliers across multiple countries, which enables us to mitigate risk. Many of our key suppliers can accommodate our growth plans as they already have done so to date. Our current suppliers are being complemented with new suppliers all of the time in order to further boost capacity further mitigate risk as we can switch supply as required to deliver the margin gains that we're seeking. We continue to make regular in-person visits to our suppliers and supplement this with daily calls by all levels of the Sosanda team, and we ensure that up-to-date external audits remain in place. From a logistics perspective, as already said, we have a really diverse strategy with regards to inbound logistics, and we have multiple freight methods, routes, and increasingly more carriers to use to maximize margins and mitigate any risk in one particular part of the supply chain. We have additional space available with our third party warehouse provider, which will accommodate greater inventory levels and throughput as we need it. And we are in the process of onboarding with more delivery companies in order to give our consumer the choice to use their preferred delivery company to bring our orders to them. On systems, our front-end systems, including our website, is fully scalable and does not require any significant change. We are in progress to upgrade our back-end system to give us an ERP solution, which can fully support all of our needs for many years to come. And finally, in terms of people, We have a highly engaged and talented team, which is still only around 70 people. Many of the team have worked in bigger businesses that have already traded overseas, for example, meaning we have much of the experience that we need to execute the next stage of our growth strategy. We look forward to the future with confidence. We've had a strong start to the second half of the year with record months of trading. Our product range for next year is incredibly strong and we have confidence in our ability to navigate external pressures as we've done consistently over the past few years. We see continued growth ahead, both on our own site and with existing third party partners. In addition, we also have new opportunities on the horizon in both the UK and overseas. We envisage launching with at least one third party international partner in 2024. The future potential for Sasanda is incredibly exciting. And now we will hand over to you for questions. And we've got quite a few questions. How do our KPIs compare with our competitors? Steve, do you want to take that? In in lots of cases, incredibly well. If we take conversion as one pivotal example, we know that 4.5% on the comparables that we do have access to Uh, Not everyone reports on conversion, but we know that that's incredibly strong. And we also know, as Julie highlighted, that click-throughs from email is what's enabling us to drive both visits to site, but more importantly, that conversion rate. So once we've captured a really good customer through customer acquisition, the click-through of email is enabling us to drive incredibly strong rates of conversion. The other KPI that we're really pleased about is once we've acquired a new customer, their propensity to purchase and purchase multiple times per annum 
is really strong. So on average, if you look at the entire uh, active customer database, it's in excess of two. But if you look at the cohort of customers that buy multiple times per annum, that's in excess of four. And I think those um, those KPIs are really strong comparable to others. Um, hopefully that answers the question. I'd just probably just add to that on the um, email as well, just to elaborate a bit on that, the the 50% of revenue that we are gen- self-generating for no additional cost through email, that's quite um, an exceptional um, KPI because we know certainly from, it's not something that other companies publish, but we know from when we interview people that it's that's unheard of that that type of rev, that amount of revenue is self generating through email, which I think really comes down to what we said in the presentation, which is our backgrounds in media and our ability to use customer communication as if it were a magazine. I suppose we treat daily emails like it's a a, a daily newsletter or a daily magazine. That means we do um, generate unheard of levels of of revenue from it. And how do the factors within the overhead cost compare with the competitors? Steve, I think that's one yeah, for you for, as well. Yeah, from what I, obviously, so Sander is, it, it is at a slightly different stage to, to other businesses. So a directly comparable uh, comparison isn't always easy. However, I think the key point to note on overheads is how it's reducing as a percent of, of our revenue, whilst at the same time, our gross margins uh, rising, which of course is why we're starting to flex into uh, sustained profitability. I think a couple of remarks to make about the future here. There is still opportunity to reduce our overhead percent of revenue further compared to where we are now. Will it keep going in the trajectory of reduction? No, probably not. But that's because we're starting to mature as an organization. And so the leaps and bounds gains that we've seen historically won't carry on. However, H2 will be lower. Um, It's a stronger period. And particularly, uh, we don't spend as much money on customer acquisition in H2 as we do in H1. H1 is a period of high customer acquisition where the ROI is greater. H2 is more a period where we're converting those customers that have been acquired and then making sure that we sell through really well to those newly acquired customers that have been brought to us in in H1. Inventory levels continue to climb, which has resulted in significant negative free cash flow during the period. I understand the reasons for the increase in inventory, but it would be useful to know the age profile of these inventories. Steve, for you as well, I think. Yeah, in in terms of age, um, we've got good stock. Um, There is always some stock that carries forward from previous selling seasons. That's normal. Um, We're no different. Um, but the number of that is not is not particularly large or anything to report on. Um, so the pivotal point, though, that I think is just worth reflecting on is the step up in inventory and why that's happened. It's for two primary reasons, really. Uh, firstly, at the end of September, we're carrying a much larger amount of in-transit stock um, because we've migrated a large proportion, particularly for the winter season, onto sea freight. And so we've got um, a point in time, really, where we've got higher levels of inbound inventory coming for the winter season. Um, Secondly, obviously one of scale. As we grow, it's important that we're investing not only for us, our own sites, Sasanda, but importantly for our third parties. One of the learnings of working with the third parties is that you maximize your sales through availability of stock. So we took the conscious decision to bring stock in earlier for this autumn and winter season in order to make sure that the stock was available for those third parties at the right time at the beginning of the autumn season. Previously, that wasn't always the case. We were learning along the way to make sure that we maximise the revenue in the early part of autumn. The best way to do that is making sure that you've got stock available for them on sale at the right time. So we're at a point in time at the end of September. From September onwards, we will start to see our inventory balance reduce. So we've got high inventory at September, and then as it goes forward through the winter season, the balance starts to reduce through to the beginning of the spring season in March, April. 
Return rates. There was some chatter in the press recently about some brands seeing faster and increased return rates in recent weeks. Have you seen any evidence of that? I'll, I'll take that. Um, no, we haven't. Our return rates are stable and they are as we would expect them to be. So our returns rates vary depending on what product mix we're selling at any one time from mid 40s to high 40s. That's as we predicted. And the only thing that we see that that m- moves that is when certain product categories are form a higher proportion of overall sales. So for example, knitwear is one of the lowest returning product categories. So if we sell a, a lot of knitwear, that will naturally reduce the overall returns rate. Um, dresses, woven dresses in particular, because they're more rigid and harder to fit to the body, they will naturally have the highest return rate. So in periods of time when dresses are particularly high, then overall returns rates would reflect that. But we're not seeing anything that we've not predicted or planned for. And regarding the sale, I noticed you started an early sale on sysanda.com. How does this compare to last year in terms of timing and scale? So um, I'll take that one, shall I? Um, So yes, we did start, uh, we started an early sale on um, Saturday, this weekend just gone. Um, And in fact, last last year, we didn't actually do a 50% off sale. So it's a bit like, because we've basically seen customer behavior return to normal. Whereas if you think back to a year ago, it wasn't normal. We were still very much in the middle of the, in the middle of the, the pandemic. Um, so, so it's a bit like when we did the sale in the, in August this year, um, that the prior August, we hadn't done a sale because it was, times were just different and we had a different amount of, um, stock and so on. So it was a planned sale this year. And in previous years, prior to the pandemic, we, we do tend to do the sales quite, quite early because we, we see very much that's where customer demand peaks quite early on. So it's when people are still able to order and get things in time for Christmas. And how much of your product is sold at full price? I'm a customer as well as a shareholder and virtually all emails come with a percentage discount. Should I start with that? And you want to add in, Ali? So we've always used, um, there are two types of um, uh, discounts. I think it's probably good to point out that that retailers use um, and that we also used. One is... um, promotional mechanics using a code, which is um, how we incentivize both repeat customers and we use it as an acquisition um, mechanic. So there's that type of promotion. And then there's also the strike through promotion, which is more about um, flash sales or, or or end of season. And we use both of those things in order to vary the messaging to customers. Um, the, the reason we use promotional mechanics is order is in order to drive um to, to to drive incentive to purchase. So what we're seeing currently is um that consumers have a degree of guilt, I think, in spending. So we're finding that promotional mechanics, whether it be strike throughs up to a certain percentage off or promotions on certain categories, get that consumer over their guilt of spending money on clothes. And um, so we're actually not discounting any more than we've discounted in the past. We're just using messaging in a different way. So the, um, and you can see that in the margin. So the margin for the second half of the financial year is higher than it was in the first half of the financial year, which obviously um, shows that the percentage of um, discount and the percentage of products sold at a discount has actually not changed. Record months in October and November is excellent, but can you give an indication of year-on-year percentage increase? Steve, do you want to um, take that? So if we take October and November combined, um, it was just below 40% year-on-year growth against harder, stronger comparables than in the previous year, uh, sorry, in the first half. So if we just look why that would be, if you remember in May 21, we did a raise to invest in more inventory, particularly for third parties, in order to capitalize on the momentum and the strong demand coming from customers with, with all of our partners. So that meant that the second half of last year, 
had stronger comparables because that inventory went to the partners and they sold really well. We're still growing significantly, both on our own site and with third parties, but the growth rate will slow. And that's as planned as well. Um, importantly, the 38% uh, that we've delivered in October and November is higher a growth rate than we were projecting for the rest of the second half of the year. Um, so we will see, or in order to achieve the consensus numbers that are in the market, um, we don't need to continue to trade at 38% up year on year. It will be lower in the balance of the year. And that's as we have planned. And in the past, you've spoken about the benefits of being able to quickly repeat order successful SKUs. How does this work if product is being shipped by freight? Ali, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, basically, we, we can do repeat orders quickly, but there are certain categories where we do have to plan much further ahead. That will be the most likely ones are knitwear and outerwear. And because these are bulky, these are the sort of uh, product that we would do on sea freight because it brings the cost down. So there is an element of some things we do have to plan ahead. It doesn't mean we can't ever get back into them. Um, and we can bring things in by air if we wanted to repeat on them. But initially, what we do is those kind of product we do plan ahead. It's probably worth also adding, Ali, I think, just in terms of the mix of our freight now. Uh, so if we go back 12 months or maybe 18 months, we were almost 100% air freight, not quite 100%, but almost. Today, we're pretty equitable between sea, air and road. And that will depend on a few things, notably country of origin and type of product. So it makes sense for heavier products such as outerwear, padded coats to come by sea. Whereas lighter product that is nearer to home, particularly out of Turkey, can be with us in, in five or six days on, on a truck. So it's about choosing the right freight method, the right routes for the right product categories. But it, it we're not bringing everything in by sea. We're balanced, actually, and, and we can flex that depending on what's the need of the business, whether it's quick turnaround product or long lead time product, as Ali's just said. And do popular items at M&S, Next, etc. mirror your own website sales or are they different profiles of customers? Ali, do you want to take that? Yeah, um, there are minor differences, but in general, we tend to sell the best sellers that are on our own site tend to be mirrored across Next and M&S. Um, there's, there's a few differences, but even in terms of the categories that dominate, they tend to be the same. So I think really um, we're seeing a similar profile in terms of the way the customer shops that's mirrored across all of them. And given the strong October and November growth, do you now see full year market forecasts as conservative and beatable? And also how has December Black Friday trading been? Steve, do you want to take that? Yeah, if you don't mind, I won't necessarily comment in more in much more detail on what the consensus numbers are. I, I think if we look at how we're trading, though, we're really pleased with how October and November traded, including the Black Friday weekend, where we had record visits for any single day on the Friday in isolation, which was really pleasing. In terms of where we are, though, if we just look at the macro environment, of course, it's not easy out there. There's a lot going on that is... Um, I suppose concerning for some 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 parts of our population, everyone is being hit with with higher bills in some way, shape, or form. So we're cautious, we're mindful, but that's not changed actually from how we've been over the last say two two and a half years. There's been some external challenges that have been around us over that whole period, whether it's COVID, whether it's supply chain issues, and now cost of living challenges for people as well. So if you don't mind, I'm not going to answer whether I believe they're conservative or not. I do think we're trading well, and I think we we continue to punch above our weight against where we are, where we've come from in terms of our uh, in terms of our journey. So overall, we're pleased. Can you update on your current cash position? Do you have adequate cash to finance growth, or will you require further funding? Steve, for you as well. Yeah, we're pleased. So to I, I didn't mention in the presentation, but it was in the RNS. We we've also got four point two million um, of net cash as at the end of November, which is unchanged versus September. The, the change that took, took place from September to November is the payables balance is much lower um, as at November, as we've continued to, to clear the inbound stock bills that, that we had uh, ready to be paid as at the end of September. So no change. 
In terms of do we have adequate, I think it's important to note that the business has changed, it's matured. Um, and I think we're bringing the stock in slightly earlier to maximise the sale opportunity, and that will continue to be the case. So yes, there is slightly earlier payments being made as a consequence, which suppresses the cash at any point in time. That said, the opportunities that that does bring um, outweigh the slightly earlier. And also as a footnote, average payment terms have increased. So as we've become larger, we're buying more and we're able to cross cost with new suppliers who are able to offer terms to us, the average payment terms continue to grow. So we'll continue to see the payables balance stretch and thus allow the cash balance to grow as well um, when we trade when we trade through the stock that we've been purchasing. So at this moment in time, we feel comfortable with where we are from a cash balance and in terms of the ability for us to self-manage and self-fund the future growth of the organisation. And are the partners, say Next or the others, responsible for all unsold stock, i.e. no returns to you? Um, no, they're not. The stock remains ours. It's different. in Where it's a concession, so with Next, Marks and & Spencers and John Lewis, they're concessions, so the stock is ours up until the point at which it's sold to a customer. Um, so ultimately, the stock all, is always ours. With the wholesale partnerships, it's the it's completely different. So with JD Williams and um, Very Group, that's a wholesale arrangement. So we hand the stock over, and that stock doesn't come back to us, and they pay us for that stock at the point at which we hand it over. So it really it depends on the partner. To add to that, Julie, I think in terms of slow moving stock, uh, which I think the question might have been alluding to, uh, some stock does come back to us. Um, but the majority of the stock sells through. So the the objective of of the the relationship between the two parties is to sell the stock through, and we work together to make sure that that happens in in various ways. So we stop replenishing certain lines when we know that we don't need to continue to. We look at the return rate curve to make sure that that's factored into the the algorithm, if you will, to make sure that the sell through is strong. And then we do tactical activity if needs be with the partner to sell that through. And that activity may be different depending on the partner and how they operate in the market. But the first port of call is to sell through on the partner website. And yes, some residue stock will come back, but it's a relatively small proportion in the grand scheme of of how much we pass over to them in the first place. Do customers at M&S and the other partners eventually go direct to the website rather than shop in store? And is that something you can track by asking how they heard about Sisanda? I'll take that, shall I? Um, so the we don't know, we don't own the customer. So the customer who shops through Next and Marks and Spencers, we would never get access to that customer's data. Um, Next and M&S own own that customer data. Um, obviously we own the data on our own website in terms of knowing where a customer is from there is no hard evidence or proof that we could say a customer finds out about us on a partner website and then may shop um, may shop with us so we don't have any hard evidence or proof um, because it's impossible really to to determine that what we do know is that they you know all those partners have got huge databases Um, and we've built brand awareness through those databases by working with them in a way that is extremely cost effective because it doesn't cost anything to build brand awareness with those partners. And it just makes logical sense that um, that those customers wouldn't necessarily always shop on Next or Marks and Spencers. They might also come to us. Um, Also, what's important really is it doesn't actually matter to us where a customer buys our product. It doesn't matter whether they buy on sasanda.com, Marks and Spencers Next, all of those things are equally good for us in terms of selling the product. Don't know whether anybody had added anything to that. And equally good in terms of uh, the directly comparable profitability of each channel. Um, so th- they all contribute fairly equally if you look at the direct costs of the operation of each of those channels. So it, it doesn't matter from that point of view either. It's about growing the, the size of the cake um, for us at the moment. And, that, and that's what we're doing really effectively. 
And a three-part question. What are your plans for UK expansion in 2023? Why are you waiting until 2024 until you expand internationally? And how easy will it be to repeat your domestic success internationally? Three questions. Ali, do you want to start? With the first bit. Um, I think it's probably worth saying straight off is that there's still lots of opportunity for growth within the UK. And that's obviously both on our own site and with the current partners that we've got. We we worked with the partners that we work with because we knew there was the opportunity for rapid growth and sustainable growth. So there is still a lot and lot of opportunity to grow within those partners in the UK. We know that there's a really big opportunity for Sansander internationally. And we're at the moment considering opportunities within that, whilst also carrying on uh, developing the opportunities that we've got within the UK. We think internationally we'll probably do this through third parties because it's been so successful in the UK. It makes sense for us to try and replicate that internationally. And the timeline for that is within uh, 24, just because there is so much to still do in the UK with our current partners and own site. But we will run the international alongside that and develop that in the same way that we did the UK. And are you seeing any impact from the Royal Mail strike? Steve, do you want to? Go. I suppose it would be wrong to say no. However, their speed at catch up has been very, very good from our perspective. So there are the days where they they don't collect from the warehouse, uh, but what they've managed to do really well is expedite the pickups and the deliveries to customers for the most part within the SLAs that we give to the customer, which is three to five working days. So. It, it means that the customer is, is waiting slightly longer than they would do um, on a where the strike is not not prevalent, but their catch up has been very, very good. Um, it's also, uh, as a footnote, not necessarily actually as a direct consequence of the strikes, but we are in, in flight uh, to onboard additional carriers. We recognise that offering just one, which has been Royal Mail historically, um, some of our consumers would prefer a different delivery company to deliver because they they know that they deliver in a certain time frame or in a, a certain way. So it's really important to be able to give that additional choice to the customer so that they can use their preferred option. So there will be some onboarding taking place in the early part of, of the next calendar year with additional carriers so that the consumer has that that choice really as to who they work with. And who do you see as your main competitors? That's always that's always a difficult question to answer um, because we don't have a direct competitor because that the, the reason we're doing so well as a business is because nobody else does what we do, both from a product perspective. Our product is completely unique, um, all designed in-house, and the aesthetic and feel of our product. It, and the way uh, our product looks is not replicate, is not nobody else does product in the same way that we do, or the breadth of product. It's the very reason why we've gone from nothing to a top five brand in Next and Marks and Spencers, because our product is so differentiated. And then on top of that, the way we photograph the product um, exacerbates, I think, the uniqueness of the range. So it's not just the clothing is unique. It's also the way we photograph the clothing is entirely you is entirely unique, makes it very desirable, um, makes uh, the clothes look very chic and sexy, and just has a feeling and an aesthetic, an aesthetic that nobody does. So it's it's always the most difficult question to to answer because there is no direct competitor. Obviously, the reality is that women shop in multiple places for clothes. That that's that's the reality. It's an absolutely humongous market in the in the UK alone for, before we even start to go overseas so the reality is is what we're doing is taking a bigger and bigger share of that purse of that purse spend and the bigger our range gets and the more wardrobe needs we're able to fulfill it's meant that um, we've been able to take a bigger and bigger spend of the of the purse of the of the consumer and do you have any plans to move into the men's market? Ali, do you want to take that? 
Um, not currently, because I think we've got our hands full with the women's <laughs> market at the moment. I mean, there's so many opportunities within the women's wear market. We, we're only scratching the surface of what we can achieve. Um, we never say never to anything. We um, consciously chose a name for the brands, the Sander, that was neither feminine or masculine, so that if we ever wanted to go into another area, uh, the brand could do that. But at the moment, we've still got so much to play for in terms of the women's market. We're sticking there for the time being. And do you feel you'll continue to offer free returns in the coming year? Shall I take that? Um, I think um, it really, we watch and um, has sit and wait and see how the market develops. Obviously, we've seen several um, other um, brands start to charge for returns. So it is definitely something that we would we would keep under consideration. And do you feel women shop around on price between third parties and sysanda.com based on your discounting and um, codes, et cetera? Um, that's quite an easy question to answer. No, they don't is the simple answer. Um, I think um, we don't see any evidence of that at all, because if um, we don't, we can often have and really quite regularly, we will have a record day with third parties while at the same time, having had um, some sort of offer on our own site. So we don't really see that shopping around of comparing prices at all. There is absolutely no evidence of it. And is there any particular region you'd focus on when you look at expanding internationally? We're open, I think I would say is the, uh, we're currently, um, we're just assessing all the possible different countries and different partners that we could work with. It's much more about choosing the right partner that we think is the you know the right route to take the first step so we're not we're not closed to any particular territory at all it's still very much up for up for discussion and consideration and do you ever see yourself operating a franchise store model rather than wholly online i think probably what ali said never say never but it's not it's not in our line of sight at all at the moment Tremendous. Thank you very much. And that's the end of questions. Julie, do you have any closing remarks? Um, only just to say thank you all very, very much for joining us today. I can see a huge amount of participants on here. So we're really grateful for you joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next year.